Okay, um, so I'm very grateful to be here as well. This is really a hotbed of social cognition research, and um, I'm glad to know that if you read the book, you still went into the field anyway. Um, <laughs> so the work I'm going to be talking about today is an illustration of a... Uh, okay, well... Will you raise your hand in the back if my voice fades out? Because I'm a little hoarse. But, um, so uh, the work I'm going to be talking about today uh, builds on work that's related to social comparison, up and down hierarchies, power, and uh, stereotype content model. And so I'm particularly happy to be here talking because I know that people here don't totally agree with me. And so it makes it more interesting to talk, than to talk to people who are all kind of saying yes, 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 whenever you talk. Um, so I hope we can have a discussion as well. Um, so, the work I'm going to be talking about is the interpersonal enactment of status comparisons. What happens when two people get together and talk to each other across status lines, and how does that go? The answer is not very well. So now you can go. <laughs> um, so our, our uh, data for this um, are going to argue that communicators polite communicators, at least, omit negativity uh, when they're describing people. Negativity omission actually creates innuendo. People infer the negativity, and that allows stereotypes to stagnate over time because they don't get contradicted. Listeners hear the innuendo, you can show this, and they infer the negativity. Impression managers use positive innuendo as a way of managing impressions that people form of them, and they might downplay warmth or confidence to convey the other one. And the kicker is that status determines which strategies people use. So high status speakers speak down warmly, but in a patronizing way, and low status speakers talk up competently, but in a self-promoting way. So this is where we're going to get to by the end of all this. Okay, so the positivity bias in psychology communication is very well established. You see it in language use. Uh, the frequency of positive words is higher than the frequency of negative words. In person evaluation, when you set up a seven-point scale, people don't use the bottom half of the scale, and so actually you only have a three-point scale, um, as those of us know who work in this field. The psychological midpoint is sort of moderately positive. People really, really don't want to say negative things about other people, even in an experiment when they're rating in describing groups in general, people use positive terms more than negative terms, and you'll see that they communicate the negativity by just leaving it out. So, uh, I've just said that. Um, so, I'm going to argue that this is especially true if people are worried about how they come across to other people because they don't want to be seen as saying negative things about other people because some of it rubs off, you're a bad person if you're talking negatively about other people in groups. And especially, this is easy to do, if you have both positive information and negative information about the person in the group, because you can just dwell on the positive and just not say the negative stuff. So you follow the Gricean norms of being honest and saying things that are relevant, but you're leaving things out. Uh, and I'm going to be drawing especially on warmth and competence as uh, primary dimensions for this. I know it's not uncontroversial now because of local uh, <laughs> contributions, but it's, it's our hammer and we're using it to hit everything. So. Uh, and Amy Cuddy and Peter Glick are co-authors on the original model. So we didn't invent warmth and competence as two dimensions of, of social perception. Lots of other people have invented it over the years in other <coughs> versions using other terms. But I find it kind of comforting, rather than feeling scooped. I feel like it must be useful because so many people keep finding these two dimensions in their salient in their explanations of human behavior and human impressions. So for those of you who haven't bumped into the stereotype content model, here's a one second uh, introduction to it. Uh, people describe other groups um, as uh, high and low, or low on warmth, which is basically trustworthiness and sociability. And then they describe them secondarily as higher low in competence, which is equivalent to status. It turns out status predicts competence at 0.8. Um, but they're different measures. Uh, so 
So what you see is that the low, low people are people without an address, which is an interesting phenomenon. You can give a whole talk about that. Why is it that homeless people and Bedouins and Roma and refugees are all in that quadrant? But that's not today's talk. And the direct contrast to that um, are the uh, in-group and its allies, the reference groups, which are high, high on both dimensions. That much you could get from the in-group, out-group literature. But what we added to this model <clears throat> is the idea that there are groups that are seen ambivalently, high on one dimension and low on the other. So all over the world, rich people are distrusted but seen to be competent. Everywhere. It's really weird. Um, and then all over the world, older people are seen as being well-intentioned but incompetent. If you want to raise your hand and say, not in East Asia, you're wrong. It's worse there. Um, so anyway, so what, what becomes interesting in this dynamic is that if you have positive and negative things to say about a group, then it gives you more flexibility in what you say and what you don't say. So here's an example from one of our more recent data sets. These are points from a cluster analysis. Um, so it's not totally reading tea leaves, it's um, working from the data. Uh, I find it entertaining that teenagers are among the lowest of the low, but children, children are, you know, sort of pitiful, you want to take care of them, um, also old people you want to take care of, uh, but you can see rich people end up where they always are, in the, in the competent and cold quadrant. Uh, so this is just an illustration from an MTurks. And every, we asked people to report on how groups are seen in society, because we thought that they might not say how they personally see groups, but when you do more individual level analysis, you get similar results. We've now tested this, thanks to Federica Durante, who is actually in Milano, so it's convenient because I can work with her while here. Uh, we've done it all over the world, and for me, it meets the eyeball test. When you see the stereotype content map from a particular country, suddenly you feel like you're seeing a geographic map of the country. It's like, oh! I understand, these are the envy um, outsider entrepreneurs, that ethnic group does that in that country. These are the kinds of refugees they have in that country, and that's why they're seen this way. <clears throat> it's, very, <clears throat> it's very informative, and I recommend it. Um, if you're gonna go to a, one of these countries, go to our website, check out the <laughs> ethnic relationships people have. Uh, and more recently, we've done it in high conflict countries, and there are some interesting moderator variables there. This is Michelle Gelfand. Okay, so that's the background. We're going to be using the stereotype content model dimensions as um, the levers for studying what we're studying on status. So let's start with communicators omitting negativity. Uh, and this is work with uh, Hillary Bergsinger and company. So it's based also on uh, the compensation effect, which is worked by Chick Judd and Vassal Isherbid and Nico Kerner and colleagues. <coughs> The idea is that the compensation effect means that warmth and competence tend to be hydraulic. If you're comparing two groups, and one group is seen as very competent, then the other group will be seen as very warm. And oftentimes that goes with status. So a high status group is seen as competent, and the low status group is seen as warm. And they have a bunch, a whole research program on this. And it works with warmth and competence, but not with other dimensions. There's kind of a hydraulic relationship, an agreement that the high status group they get competence and the low status group gets awarded more. So we use this in this research um, because it occurred to us that this follows the positivity norm and the conversational norm. You're not really supposed to lie to other people in your communication, but as long as you can just say something true, that's good enough. And so you can just say the positive thing and leave out the negative thing. Um, so in the first studies, we looked at how people describe individuals. Very simple. Uh, the individuals, we describe them uh, to the participants as high or low on competence and high or low on warmth. Uh, and then here's how we did it. You can read it. So it's right out there. It's, it's quite obvious what we're saying to them. So then we asked them how would they communicate about this person to somebody else? What, 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 and we gave them, we've done this various ways, but in this particular way, we gave them choices of synonyms for warmth and competence. And 
a warm promote copy. So the likelihood of saying something to a casual acquaintance is study one. Study two, we had a black target, which in the United States makes people very nervous about what they're saying and how they come across. And we manipulated the audience for degrees of closeness, because if it's a self-presentational concern, it should be most for people you don't know very well, at least for talking to yourself. Uh, in study three, we did it the same thing, but between subjects, um, and we started to look at mediation in terms of self-presentation as opposed to other things. So, okay, we're going to do this together. These are the three studies. Uh, the, the vertical axis is the likelihood of using the statement. What you're looking for is the use of the gray strategy, which is omitting the negative dimension. Okay, so at the two extremes outside the circle are intelligent and kind and unintelligent and unkind. Okay, so this is all positive or all negative. And so you can see, even in this case, uh, people use one dimension only sometimes. But the more interesting test of our hypothesis are the ambivalent cases where you can see that the gray bar, which is mentioning the positive and omitting the negative, is a very popular choice as compared to saying everything. People don't lie very often, so uh, the white one is inaccuracies. So people don't do that so much. They either say everything or, um, especially in the ambivalent case, they use innuendo um, or incomplete. They just focus on the positive. Uh, so it seems to be mediated by self-presentational concerns when we ask them how much they care about how they come across but with both these um, multiple choice DVs and with the open-ended descriptions it seems to mediate the effect in both cases so it's consistent with the idea that we have which is people are worried about how they come across if they say negative things about other people to someone they don't know very well it's one thing to say it to your close friend you know or to yourself um, so where does this take us? The thought that we had was, this allows you to do stereotype and bio-mission. So what do you think of your new department chair? Well, she's really nice. <laughs> right? I mean, but is that damning by faint praise or what? Right? So I'm implying that she's not very swift, she's not very smart. Um, so stereotype and bio-mission, we decided to build on the very first uh, study of stereotyping, which was done in 1933 by Katz and Braley, they had 10 ethnic and national groups that they, that they selected, and 84 adjectives. People could check off the adjectives that applied to the groups. And so it, luckily for us, it was replicated in the 50s and again in the early 70s. When I got to Princeton in 2000, I said, it's about time, right? So we did it too. And what we did, was take the method that was repeated the most often in these in this sequence of studies. Um, and uh, we took the 84 adjectives and had somebody code them on warmth and confidence, right? So that we, and it, you know, they, they're all codable in terms of warmth and confidence. And so what we could do is sort of retrofit our model to these other data. And what we predicted was that there would be more omission over time, given anti-prejudice norms in the modern world. So you're not supposed to say bad things about groups, and so people would more and more omit the negative words when they're describing these groups over time. A little historical footnote, there was a study done by Katz and Braley, published two years after the initial study, in which they said the more the Princeton student adhered to norms, the more biased they would be. So that's how times change, right? Because now the more they adhere to local norms, the less biased they would be. So norms change over time. And we're going to see this moderation over time, in particular for ambivalently negative groups, right? Because if people say the positive and leave out the negative, the group overall is going to look more modern. So here's an example of the 1933 data repurposed in the stereotype content model space. You can see the Germans are seen as very competent, but not so warm. Uh, the Americans are pretty good, but we think the English are better, or at least we did in 33. Uh, one continuing mystery to me is why Americans always put Turks down here. In all four data sets, the Turks are here, and they don't know anything about Turkish people. <laughs> so I, I still have not figured out why that's so negative. Um, and in this data set, uh, 
quote, Negroes or African Americans are seen as well intentioned, but not so, not so common. Anyway, this is what it looks like. Uh, so let's look at uh, first the warmth dimension. The dotted line are the initially warm groups and their ratings over time. You can see that's flat. So people's mentioning of warm traits for these groups is not changing so much for the positive groups. They're not omitting positive stereotypes. But if you look at the groups that were initially seen as cold, over time, people stop mentioning those. They're not flipping it. They're not suddenly saying the Turks are warm, right? Or even Germans. Um, but they're saying they're OK. So they're, um, so they're just being neutral on what used to be negative dimensions. And if you look at the competence ones, it's the same story in reverse. So the initially competent groups, the Germans are still competent, I'm happy to say. Um, but the initially incompetent groups, they stop saying that they're incompetent. They just get neutral. So what this means is, over time, there's moderation, because only the positive is being mentioned, and the negative is being omitted. <coughs> so people are moderating just the negative, negative dimension, but the outgroups are then still, still Overall, they're still rated in the same way relative to each other because we haven't flipped any of the negativity. We just left it out. And so when you see how the groups end up, when they're rated by stereotype content or by the label, they're basically in the same places in the space, even though it's less negative. The whole scale's been shifted. OK. So what I hope I've at least convinced you to be open to is the hypothesis that people leave out negativity but that it allows stereotypes to stagnate over time because you're not saying stuff, but you're not contradicting it either. And by saying only the warm part, if you could say, sorry, the positive part, if you could say something positive on the other dimension, but you're not, the implication is it's bad. Okay, so this innuendo effect, we wanted to demonstrate it specifically. This is Nico Kervin and Hilary Bergseeker. So the logic is if there are a lot of ambivalent outgroups, and people trade off confidence and warmth, that when you omit the negative and only mention the positive dimension, people understand that, that they will report um, the negative dimension is there. Okay, so we read the same kind of description of a, of a person, manipulated positive being confidence or just a general, um, sorry, warmth confidence or general positivity thing. We thought it might matter uh, what context you're in. So if you're in a work context, you're expecting to hear competence information and you leave it out. People are especially sensitive to it, maybe. And ditto for social settings. If you leave out the person's warmth, then maybe it's because you can't say anything good. Um, so we looked at open-ended descriptions, absolute ratings, relative likability, and then suitability for including in a, a work or social group. So courage. I know it's after lunch. We're going to walk through this together. Uh, OK, so taking the warmth ratings first, if the other person mentions competence, then you can see the warmth ratings go way down. That's the white boxes. OK, so listeners are referring lower absolute warmth uh, when you mention competence only. And the opposite goes for competence. So for the competence ratings, if you mention warmth, listeners infer lower absolute competence. And in this particular case, the context doesn't seem to matter, which surprised us. But it matters in the mediation. So it's only on the contextually relevant dimension, that is, warmth for social settings and competence for work settings, that you get mediation uh, of the effect of who you want to include in the group. So um, the absolute rating and relative rating both are consistent with the idea that um, people are using these trade-offs to decide who to include. OK, then we went one step further besides replicating and specifying male and female targets. Uh, we gave the open-ended descriptions to a second group of people to see what they would make of them specifically. What you see is that new participants reading those descriptions uh, infer that the omitted salient dimension is there. So, for example, for a social companion, if you say he's really smart, 
they infer that he's not very nice. Um, and the innuendo especially seems to happen for female targets at work. That's the only one that goes non-significantly below the line. But it doesn't work so well for male targets at work, but it's for three out of four of the cases. Okay, so what I hope you are open to believing is that uh, when listeners hear the union, I know they infer the negativity from it. So it's almost like a secret code between the communicators. You know, that if, if I'm leaving it out, it must be bad. And that has implications for who you want to invite on your travel companion or who you want to include in the work group. So those of us who write letters of reference know but if we spend the whole thing talking about how nice somebody is, we're killing them for the job. And if you write all about how geeky and smart the person is, and you don't have a line at the end that says, and besides, he's a good team player, you can also kill them for the job because people think they don't work well with others. Right? So it's what you leave out is as important as what you include. Okay, so people who are trying to convey an impression to other people, they get this dynamic, they use it. So as an example of this with uh, Deborah Halloy, uh, we, we set up a series of studies in which we asked people to convey an impression of themselves to a chat room. We said, you know, in this chat room, the norm is to be very warm, or in this warm, the norm is to be very confident, or to be very positive. So when they are asked to, to, as an explicit goal to be one of these ways, what do they convey? So what you see is when you tell them to be warm, not surprisingly, they pick more words to describe themselves. But what's interesting and weird is they downplay competence words relative to the control group. When you tell them to be competent, they pick competence words. But what's interesting is they also downplay warmth words relative to the control group. So people get it. You know, it's a little like uh, sexist men and women in the 50s if the woman wanted the guy to like her, she had to play dumb, right? Because if she was too smart, then he wouldn't like her. So there's a trade-off between being liked and being respected. And so, well, I'll, I'll tell more stories. <laughs> uh, so impression managers understand this dynamic, and they use it. So now I'm going to combine this and talk about status bring status in and people managing their impressions across status lines, understanding all these dynamics. So the first set of studies are with Jill Svensionis, looking at how social goals trade, uh, drive these warmth confidence trade-offs. So it was an interviewer uh, study where people were trying to present themselves to an interviewer who wanted team players uh, or efficient workers for emphasizing warmth versus confidence. And we've used it before, and you can get people to do this. They don't understand the instructions. Uh, so we were wonder, looked at the number of traits people shared that were warm or competent. And the IVs, again, were ingratiation, which is being a team player, or promotion being an efficient worker. OK, so when they're told to self-promote, they get it. They convey more competence traits than warmth traits. When they're told to ingratiate, they convey more warmth traits than confidence ones. Both, they can do both. And neither, there's a slight bias to conveying confidence in this study. OK, so people can do it if you ask them explicitly to do it. Um, so the, to take it to status comparisons, so if people can set goals to appear more confident and trade -off, use the trade-off to do that, what happens when a high status person who is presumed to be competent, remember as an aside, I said the correlation between status and competence worldwide is pointing. It's embarrassingly high. People really believe in meritocracy. So a high competence person, a high status person can be presumed to be competent. And a low status person can be presumed to be not so competent. So they have different goals going into the interaction. I'll give you some examples. So high status speakers are more worried about being seen as warm and nice because they know they've got the confidence covered. And low status speakers are more worried about showing their confidence because they've got the warmth covered. 
So we did a scenario online. Most MTurkers are employed, so they could or have been employed, so they can imagine a workplace scenario. You're paired with somebody, uh, a coworker from a different division, so they're not controlling your fate, but you are interacting with somebody who's higher or lower in status. And how much do you want your partner to know? A bunch of warm things or a bunch of confidence. Things. It works whether you have them pick from a list or whether you have them rate them how much do you want them to know. And the comparison is upward or downward or neither. So it's somebody who's higher status than you, somebody who's lower status than you, or just somebody who's a peer. So when they're comparing down, uh, they convey more warmth and confidence information. So I'm the boss, I'm talking to the subordinate, and I'm not trying to prove my confidence because I know I don't have to worry about that, worry about whether I'm warm or not. It's the opposite uh, when they're comparing upward, and it's about even in this case when they're doing either. Uh, when we ask them specifically on a trade-off scale from more, is it more important to be warm or more important to be competent? So we make them trade it off. They report that when they're comparing down, it's slightly more important to be warm versus when they're comparing up. In general, in the workplace setting, there's a bias toward competence, but it varies depending on whether they're comparing up or down. Okay. I can't know any more data. Okay, here we go. Um, so, that, so I've been talking about it as if people are most worried about how they personally come across, but it could be that, you know, they're matching the other person. Right, so if I'm a high status person talking to a lower status person who I believe to be warm, maybe I'm just trying to be warm in order to get down with the people, you know, and match them. Or is it because I'm worried about how I come across? Those are two different concerns, right? So it could be um, a compensation effect matching the other person's actual warmth or confidence, or it could be I'm worried about what I'm lacking. So we told them about bosses and subordinates who are, who are counter-stereotypical. Friendly bosses, competent subordinates. And we did that by saying there were rumors that this person was, in the first study, very friendly or very unfriendly. In the second study, very competent, intelligent or not intelligent. Uh, so otherwise, it's the same design as before, comparing upward and downward. So this is the replication, this part. So for a not very friendly um, boss or a very friendly subordinate, people do the standard thing. They do the compensation. Um, but when you manipulate the counter-stereotypicality, the effect goes away, basically. So unfortunately, it doesn't disambiguate between the matching versus the compensation thing. Either one could be true. Um, get the same thing with the intelligence one where it's not working. Okay. So we replicate the effect with the stereotypical boss and subordinate and we make it go away more or less with the counter stereotypical one. So I wish I could tell you that we knew for sure whether people are more concerned about themselves or the other person. Some other data that we have convinced me that what's going on is the high status person is worried about themselves. So am I seen as a nice person because I know I've got competence? And the lower status person is worried about the high status person. So the reason it's hard to find mediation is that two different people are doing two different things. So the high status person has respect, they want liking, and the low status person has liking and they want to impress the other, want to make the other person comfortable and be confident as, as they are. Okay, so the status comparison studies show that people seem to have impression management goals that are consistent with status and the stereotype of their group. Uh, ingratiation versus self-promotion accordingly. I've just described that. Um, but you can make it, you can push it around by manipulating the stereotypes. Okay, final set of studies is about race and whether race, manip whether race imitates status. Better. Sorry. Well, I'll finish. <laughs> <laughs>
and the bus will go away. So uh, in the United States, people have very much both implicit and explicit race status associations. We've done a sort of IAT in our lab where we have pictures of faces that are black or white in varying degrees. And we associate them with high status and low status jobs, and people very reliably associate whites with higher status jobs and blacks with lower status jobs. So this association is there, so it seems like all those dynamics I was just talking about should happen between blacks and whites when they're interacting with each other. I'm going to tell you about studies where whites are interacting with black and white partners. It's harder to get black participants. We're doing that, but it's slower because there are fewer of them in the pool, even in the MTURC. Okay, so we have whites presenting, self-presenting a warmth and confidence to a white or black partner. We're predicting that what whites are worried about in an interracial interaction is, does this person think I'm nice? Do they think I'm racist? They're worried about coming across as warm and moral. They're not so worried about being confident. Uh, there's some related previous research by my colleagues, Berg Seeker and Shelton and Jen Richardson. Um, but in our case, we're looking at it um, simultaneously and looking at their self-reported goals. Okay, so um, we've done several studies on this. I'm just going to tell you about a couple of them. One is with 400 or so interpreters. Uh, they're joining, they're told in a hypothetical scenario, they're joining a book club. They have to email. Lakeisha, which is a stereotypically black name, or Emily, which is a stereotypically white name. And we want to know what kinds of words they're using to present, to present themselves. We decided to look at right-wing authoritarianism and social dominance orientation because they're, they're heavily correlated with racial attitudes, and we thought they might be useful moderators. It turns out they are, and not in the way you think. So we predicted that it's liberals who care the most about how they're coming across black people. The conservatives don't really care. So they're not going to adjust their self-presentation strategies. But the liberals might well, because they care a lot about seeming racist. And what you find is that for low RWA people, the dark bar, when they're talking to a black person, they present fewer confidence words. And this is a very subtle uh, measure, because what we have is complicated vocabulary words and simple vocabulary words. So when the liberal whites are talking to a black person, they use simpler vocabulary. Do I mean it's kind of patronizing? Really. They're not changing how positive or negative the words are, which is the warmth dimension, and, the, and they're doing this. Yeah, uh, and this is measuring it with RWA. It doesn't work with SEO, but it works reliably over and over again with RWA. Uh, in another study, um, we found similar things. Um, we looked at open-ended responses. Um, we used Luke, which is an automatic coding system for uh, the content of open-ended things, open-ended descriptions. So in this case, we had people present a personal profile, introduce whites, introducing themselves to a black or a white partner. Um, they had to pick an avatar and give their first name. And we again manipulated the race of the partner by the avatar <coughs> they chose and by also having a stereotypic name, but not quite as stereotypical as Lakeisha and Emily. Uh, so we have a whole big variety of traits. In the interest of time, I'll just present one. These are PVs. Uh, and we look at the same moderators and made the same prediction. So in the Luke database, the competence dimension is, is um, described mainly by agency, which is the um, tendency to be able to get things done. And it's frequently used as a component of, of the competence dimension. You get the same thing. So um, for the low RWA people, which is the bottom orange line, when they're talking to a black person, um, they use fewer agentic words. And for the high RWA, they actually use more agentic words. So for the conservatives, when they're talking to a black person, they want to come across as more competent. This is not as reliable as the other one, but it's there this time. Okay. So here's the killer study in the last one. The 
killer study is RWA and liberalism differ reliably by political parties. So you've got Democrats and Republicans in the United States. It's a very simple dimension, conservative to progressive. We would predict that Democrats would do this more than Republicans, right? Because they care about how they're coming across to minority audiences. So Sidney had the brilliant idea to look at presidential campaign speeches to minority audiences or majority audiences. And she found 24 from Democrats, they're all white, and 14 from Republicans, all white. So the reassuring thing for a Democrat is that Democrats are showing up for minority audiences. That's the only good news. Um, so each minority speech, she paired it with comparable speech to a majority white audience for a total of 76 speeches, which we then analyzed by Luke. What you see from the Democrats is the same compensation thing going on. So on the left are agentic words when they're talking to a white audience, they're using more agentic words than when they're talking to a minority audience. They're patronizing, right? And uh, they're using slightly warmer words for the minority audience, which is the red bars. So what I think of it as, you know, the white presidential candidates, when they talk to minority audience, they're trying to get down with the people, right? They're sort of patronizing this guy the way, but at least they care about it um, because the Republicans aren't doing that at all. So, you know, there's kind of good news, bad news in this, if you're, regardless of your political Okay, so what I hope that you agree with is that we at least have a plausible argument for the phenomena that we're talking about across a variety of paradigms. We have some ideas about the mechanisms of it, which seem to be self-presentational and concern across a variety of paradigms. Um, and the real world impact, which is that uh, stereotypes are allowed to continue. Uh, and I want to thank uh, my lab, because it takes a village to do research, and here's my village. Thank you for listening. <laughs>